Welcome back with a smiling face. Links to previous episodes are given in the video description, so don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. The Edge of Tomorrow Episode 14 Chapter 108 Dex reacted instantly, slamming on the gas as he swerved into the center lane. We narrowly missed a little maroon Buick, whose nasal-sounding horn blared down the highway. Before the vehicle could fully regain its balance, Carson lifted herself out the minivan and onto the ledge of the window. My heart stuttered a few beats as I heard the deafening sound of a gun being shot. Bullets peppered the dark-colored SUV that drove alongside of us. They swerved to the right, but it seemed we weren't the only ones with a bulletproof vehicle. The SUV veered right, trying to run us onto the shoulder. Carson snarled tearing the visor off her head and chucking it out the window. They're boxing us in. If you don't act fast, Dex, we're screwed. When Dex's grip on the steering wheel turned white-knuckled, I knew I wasn't going to like what happened next. Dex lifted his head and eyed the four of us in the rear-view mirror, his eyes straying to me last. Our orders are to get you to the drop at all costs. He said firmly, eyes locked on my own. Where I'm sure mine were wide with the adrenaline that thundered through my veins, his were strong and bright. Even though I hardly knew this man, there was a sense of honor that was concrete within him. It guided his thoughts, his life, the decisions he made and the people he helped. I had no clue what Dex's stake in all of this was, but I was surprised to find that I truly did trust him with my life. My response was a yelp as Dex turned the wheel all the way to the left, hurling us through the right lane of traffic and towards the metal guardrail that led into the forest below. Everything seemed to slow as we clipped the front of one car, and tore through the guardrail like cheap ribbon. I could feel the impact in my teeth, and hear the crunch and scream of metal as it was torn to shreds. My stomach dropped as I saw the magnitude of the hill we were about to roll down and the thick trees that seemed to sit everywhere. I felt like a rag doll in the hands of a child as the minivan we were in thundered over branches and stones, the poor suspension groaning from the off-road trip. It was Kate who kept the seatbelt from strangling me as I was thrown forwards. Alec helped keep Tori in place, who was pale-faced and wide-eyed in the back. The tree trunk that we clipped sent us careening forwards, into a roll that made me miss our previous position. I could feel something splash against my face, and smelled the brief but fresh scent of water as it mixed with motor oil and blood. It was a tree that stopped our descent, and forced the car to a stop. The horn of the minivan blared throughout the forest, loud and shrill as it told all nearby that we were here. Blood rushed to my head, and a mix of crimson and onyx danced behind my eyes. Jewels of shimmering color, covering the world in a filter that seemed to move as I blinked and groaned. I had never been in a car accident before but the feeling of having my bones crushed, it was one I never wanted to repeat. The seat belt dug into my shoulder and waist. Glass was inches from my fingertips, which hung above my head and grazed the roof of the van. The van itself was upside down, the roof crushed from our roll. I'm going to get you down, doll. Alec's voice was a whisper away, smoothing out my panic before it could take root. Just hold still, this isn't going to feel very good. My entire body quite literally protested as I heard and felt the click of the seat belt, followed by gravity claiming me for itself. Alec lessened the impact, but any sensation sent pain skittering along my skin and bones. Glass dug into my skin, but was a mere afterthought with everything else going on. Half blind with blood staining my eyes, I grabbed onto Alec's hand and crawled as he helped pull me from the minivan. Once I felt the wet dirt beneath my knees, I frantically wiped the blood from my eyes with a dry piece of my shirt. The van was a crumpled husk, a tin can that had been kicked too many times. Shimmering pieces of glass littered the ground along with various scraps of metal. 
Alex's strong hands kept me from stumbling forwards when Kate and Tori crawled from the vehicle. St, we need to go. Dex grunted, spitting out a wad of blood as he hurried to the back of the minivan. The back window was shattered from the roll, making it easy for him to reach in and grab two backpacks filled to the brim. I went a little wide-eyed when he wrenched open a duffel bag full of various firearms and types of silver ammunition. It was somewhat comforting to know that despite his usual jolly demeanor, his intimidating looks weren't just for show. He tossed one of the backpacks at Cade, and within seconds, was urging us to leave. Wait I stammered, stumbling to a halt when I saw the unconscious figure of Carson. I hadn't noticed her before, caught up in the adrenaline and pain. The seatbelt was the only thing that kept her from falling to the floor but unlike the rest of us, she was unconscious. Blood fell in a thick stream from a wound in her head. No, Claire. Dex snarled, using a firm but gentle hand to urge me forwards. There it was the purpose for his intimidating looks. I could see it in the way he towered over me, glowering as he urged me to move. Any sane person would have been frightened, but it wasn't anger Dex felt. His grief and pain made my legs weak, but the unbreakable sense of honor within him let me know that Dex would complete this mission, no matter what he had to leave behind. Her legs are pinned, one is broken. She understands the cost. I had a split second, just one to decide what I was going to do. There was no time for thought, so I acted. Don't make me grab you, kid. Dex warned his eyes narrowing. Don't think about it. Kate snarled, and I took that as my chance to bolt. I dug my feet into the earth, and turned on my heel. Dex hadn't been expecting me to run back to where Carson was, but the twins did they had seen in my eyes the moment I made up my mind. I half thought they would grab at me, drag me back and fling me over their shoulder as we escaped, leaving Carson to be worse. Instead of making a grab for me, they ran ahead. Cade to the back of the van, and Alec to the passenger side. He kicked and tore at the door, finally getting the crumpled thing off after the scream of metal filled the air. Dex cursed and ran a hand over his face, smearing the blood on his head and cheek, before running to the twins' side. You two, get over here and grab a gun. Dex snarled at Tori and I kicking us into action. He shouted towards Alec and Cade, there should be a crowbar somewhere in there. Every move of my muscles sent agony through my bones and ribcage. I had definitely broken a rib or two, perhaps even my collarbone. I could feel myself slowly knitting back together. Every thread of bone was like a stinging pain beneath the skin, very carefully making me whole again. Tori and I stumbled over to the back of the overturned minivan. Dex thrusted near-identical handguns into our arms and quickly pointed at the two most important parts. Turn the safety off. Aim, shoot. And don't hesitate. He told the two of us, his words fast and charged with the weight of oncoming violence. They won't send all they have yet, takes time to travel. The ones who were following us, they'll find us before we can get Carson out. Just so you know, kid. Anything happens to you, and it's my skin on the line. They wouldn't have KLD her, would they? I asked, rather than give in to the guilt that bubbled in my stomach. From the heaviness in Dex's eyes, he knew what I was implying. No, Marcus's men would not have KLD Carson not with how close she had been to me. Would he te her first? Or would he have the same wolf who looked into my head, look into hers? He would ring her for all the information she had, and only when she was no longer of use, would he finally dispose of her. From his emotions alone, I could tell that Dex and Carson weren't mates. There was a deep bond there, but it wasn't one that stemmed from romantic feelings. They were partners, friends in every sense of the word. 
there was an acceptance between them that was strange, as though they saw each other in their entirety, and embraced the darkness they saw within. No Dex said after few seconds, they would not KL her. Behind the sound of Alec and Cade working to free Carson, there was something else in the background. I strained my ears to listen, but the pain behind my eyes made it hard to focus. I naturally looked towards Dex, who was fixated on a part of the forest just behind me. Drop. The word was thrown from his mouth with deadly accuracy, each letter only a fraction of a second long. The twins had told me about an Alpha command weeks ago, and though I knew its power wouldn't work on me, I registered the meaning behind his urgency. A deafening blast rang out, followed by a second, at the same time a snarl ripped past my ear. Two dull thuds sounded, followed by the sound of two wolves slumping to the ground. You're an Alpha. I gaped up at him trying not to look at the werewolf only a foot from where I sat. You shouldn't have gone back for her, Claire. Dex shook his head, ignoring my question completely, his bushy eyebrows knitted together. You are more important than the rest of us. No, the change we want to bring is what's important. I shook my head, refusing to believe what he was saying. That kind of thinking that one person's life is more important than someone else's, that's what helps men like Marcus sleep at night. Dex remained silent for a few seconds, then reached out a hand. Perhaps you're right, but your powers in the hands of our enemies would cost us everything. He finally said, once I was on my feet and brushing the dirt from my body. Another shot rang out through the forest, and I turned to stare wide-eyed at Tori. What? She shrugged, nudging the wolf with her foot. Dad might be a doctor, but he has hobbies too. Plus, I actually have really good aim. Good, hold on to that. Dex grunted, something tells me we're going to need it. I palmed the gun in my hands, feeling the cool metal that had slowly warmed to my clammy touch. I had yet to use the thing and I desperately hoped I wouldn't need to. With Carson on Alec's shoulders, we trekked through the forest. I noticed Dex doing something with his hands as we walked, holding them palms up. What are you doing? I asked, eyeing his hands as he held them out. He cleared his throat a bit awkwardly and glanced down at me, I'm covering our scents. You're covering our scents. I repeated my light laughter out when I noticed how serious he was. How? How do you feel emotions, or the souls out of people? He asked with a lifted eyebrow, turning his gaze back to the forest. Magic, I suppose. I felt my jaw slip a bit further, you're a white wolf. One of many in my family. Dex nodded curtly, telling me I'd get nothing more out of him. An hour slowly turned into three, each one racked with anxiety as every little sound brought on a wave of paranoia. Each snap of a branch was a wolf in waiting, ready to tear me away from my mates at all costs. I watched the descent of the sun as it dipped behind the trees, and felt fatigue settle in my bones. I found a little cave system over here. Dex grunted, shoving back the hanging limbs of a plant. He glanced towards Carson, the concern he felt blank from his face. Gonna have to set her leg if it's to heal properly. You four go on in there. I'm going to see if I can scatter our scents a bit further. Buy us a few hours. I can set her leg. Like I said, my dad's a doctor. Tori shrugged, you got a first aid kit in one of those bags. Back compartment. Dex nodded, handing the bag to Tori. Much appreciated. While I wasn't too excited to sleep in a damp cave, it was partially obscured from view thanks to a wall of moss and vine. It covered the rock like a blanket, leaving a small slit to pass through. I kneeled beside Tori and Carson, while Alec wandered through the cave with a flashlight in hand. 
His reasoning was to find another exit, just in case we needed to make a fast escape. While I appreciated the forward thinking, I hoped there was enough running for the day. That night, I sat between the twins, feeling the chill of night settle into my bones. We weren't staying long, just a few hours until Carson woke up and her leg healed a little more. I traced patterns along Alec's arm, which was slung over my midsection as he snored softly. It was Kate who had trouble sleeping, just as I did. What are you thinking about? I asked, the corners of my lips twitching from the question. Kate let out a near-silent chuckle, his eyes flickering towards where I laid beside him. I could choose whether or not to hear the twins' thoughts. While sometimes it was instinctual to listen in and communicate through our thoughts, there were other times I gave them their privacy. Honestly. Kate mused, his voice gravely even in his thoughts. I'm thinking about what life will be like once Marcus Novak is dead. This sounds calluses, but part of me regrets not just sucking his soul out during the first meeting. I would have saved so many wolves so much pain. I frown through the darkness, how horrible is that? It's not horrible at all. As a Luna it's in your nature to love your people fiercely, to protect and defend at all costs. Cade replied, his voice surprisingly soft. It was a rarity considering how abrasive he could be to everyone else. Normally I'd agree just cling someone and being through with it, but I don't think that would have helped in this case. If you had KLD Marcus during any of the meetings, you'd only be confirming the negative rumors about you. That you're some kind of uncontrollable monster. I guess you're right. I chuckled softly, turning so that I could place my head on his shoulder. At some point, I must have dozed off because when I opened my eyes, Kate's heavy breathing filled my ears. A trickle of emotions played at the edges of my mind, nearly out of range. Slowly, I extracted myself from the two of them. Their body heat alone was enough to warm me up, even coating me in a thin layer of sweat. The emotions I felt were anticipation, excitement, and even fear. They grew closer, stronger only to fade off into the distance. I knew that venturing off alone was the worst possible thing to do, but there was something propelling me forward. Just as I readied myself to step out of the cave, a hand wrapped around my wrist. A scream bubbled on my lips when I was spun around, into the hard embrace of Alec. A single eyebrow was lifted as he looked down on me, his eyes devoid of humor. I feel emotions, a lot of them. I told him through our bond, I want to see who they're coming from. And you planned on going off by yourself? He asked, his eyebrow frozen in that upright position. I opened my mouth and glanced towards the mouth of the cave, only to snap it shut. He had a point, and he knew it very clearly from the heat rushing to my face. Well, next time. Wake one of us up so we can go with you. He warned, the command in his voice made something inside of me flutter. We'll talk about you sneaking off without us later, when Kate is awake and we are no longer running for our lives. It was a good thing I hadn't snuck out from the cave, because a second later, Dex was already awake. His eyes snapped open as Tori sniffled in her sleep. Kate followed suit, and before long, we were all awake. The moon still rained, even though a few hours had passed. Carson was the last to wake up, letting out a soft groan as her fingers found the swelling on her head. The gaping wound was healing nicely, thanks to the butterfly stitches given by Tori. Half of her face was still blue and purple from the bruising, but it was a step up from earlier. Even after a few hours, she couldn't place her full weight on her leg. Tori all but forbade it until we managed to get her to a pack doctor. What was that about? Dex asked, eyeing Alec and I as we stood close to the mouth of the cave. I feel emotions coming from somewhere. I explained, leaving out the part where I had planned to go off on my own. 
My momentary lapse of common sense did not need to be broadcasted. There's at least four or five, but they keep fading in and out. It's making it hard to get a read on them. Even though the emotions had piqued my curiosity, I was forced to let it go when we finally slipped from the cave ten minutes later. Now that Carson was awake, and could walk with the help of the twins, we needed to be back on the move. It was easier, treading through the forest at night. The air was light and cool, chasing away the sweat that clung to my body and clothes. We walked for at least two hours, and I waited and watched as the distant emotions grew stronger. Dex somehow managed to catch on to the light scent of Marcus's men as they set up their camp in the forest. They were also trying their best to cover themselves, but Dex's abilities seemed to encompass all things smell-related. It was an odd gift, but actually very useful if you needed to sneak around without getting caught. We planned to veer out of the way, looping as far around them as we could. They couldn't detect our scents, not with Dex covering us, but they could hear us if we spoke. Our heartbeats and breath were dad out by the nightlife within the forest, though I could hear the men's chortles and jokes from a mile away. It was a snide comment, something tossed into the conversation that caught my attention and made both Tori and I halt in our tracks. Did you hear, Alpha's prodigal son has returned home? One of the men cackled, which led to a fit of raspy coughing. I cringed as he spat on the forest floor and continued in his grating voice. Bet you that boy got the beating of his lifetime for helping her. The other men laughed in tandem, spewing vile nonsense as they egged each other on. I knew that both Dex and Carson wanted to continue forwards, but they were clueless as to the importance of what these men were saying. They had no clue Zane's role in all of this nor the fact that we needed him to help tip the scales in this war. He's rightfully suspicious of the ingrateful pup. Another cackled, followed by mumbles of agreement. Don't matter he's just a figurehead. Once the kid is old enough to take over, Alpha will never let go of control. The conversation strayed, and just as we were about to continue forwards, one of the men said something that made the others halt in their tracks. Did you hear about the rumor swirling around? He said to his group, his voice ending in a gruff laugh. The one about the breeding. Gone was the jovial mood, the boasting, and jokes that came with a bunch of smelly, drunk men. Careful where you spew that st, Damarcus. One spat, snarling at the man who had spoken. If his inner circle hears you even mentioned it, we're all dead. Each and every one of us. It's not going to get back to him, the whole pack's talking about it. He rasped, his voice deepening as he became defensive. He's too busy looking for the leak to bother with us grunts. Don't want the people finding out what he's been doing with his little white wolf project. Seth, what are you talking now? One of the men tried to lighten the mood, but that opportunity had long passed. To HL with you, it's not ST. He snapped, wholeheartedly believing every word he spoke. Alpha's been experimenting on the white wolves he keeps, the ones he says works for the pack. He's been making them have kids, mixing their powers until he comes up with something new. Word has it, a nursemaid spilled the truth last month. Said there were rooms full of screaming babies and that some some didn't even look human anymore. I could feel my blood and sweat run cold at his words, followed by rage so strong so consuming, I promptly blacked out. Chapter 109 When all of my senses were blocked, it was the emotions I felt. They were at their rawest, churning seas of rage and disgust, boiling lakes of hatred and desperation. Those festering, Poisonous emotions bubbled beneath my skin, picking and scratching as they fought past my control. Floating in that darkness, with nothing but those carnal emotions guiding my thoughts, I couldn't remember why I was holding them back in the first place, why I shied away from what I could do. 
My powers weren't beautiful or inspiring, they were blunt and vicious. Unashamed of the destruction they could cause. No matter how dark my abilities were, there was this voice in the back of my head that told me only brutality would win this war, only rage would end Marcus Novak's life. As those last shreds of fear and shame left my mind, I unleashed the hailstorm of emotions on the guards that had invoked them. I wished more than anything I could give them the full scope of my anger, my desperation to help these wolves, but I could not. That kind of anger could split the world, could crack it wide open. That kind of anger was already reserved for someone special. I could see their faces in my mind, mixed in with those of Marcus's men. The white wolves, the men, women and children that were used for their power. Lives deemed less than and tossed aside in the pursuit for more power. They begged for help, for someone with enough power and control to rival Marcus, to care enough to force change. I wasn't sure when I had begun feeding from the life forces of Marcus's men, but their strength washed over me in waves of electrifying energy. They sharpened my vision until everything seemed almost too clear, too saturated. My vision came back in pieces, flashes of images purely driven by this feral rage. It rippled over my skin, almost shimmering like heat waves as I darted through the brush and trees, right into the center of the men's camp. Don't touch her. Alex's snarl was a mere afterthought, background chatter as I flung myself at the men. She has no control over what she's doing right now. It's better we stay out of her way and let her finish. We'll step in if need be. Something tells me it won't be necessary. Cade murmured, and if I had been paying attention, I would have heard the awe in his voice. Feel how enraged she is? They won't be able to lay a finger on her. There were six in total, four of which had been rolling around in agony the moment I sent those festering emotions loose. The two that had managed to remain on their feet, they were as rotten as Marcus was. Truly devoid of any humanity that might make them cower at the devastation wrought. I charged at the two first, noting how any surprise only lasted a fraction of a second as it crossed their faces. Only to be replaced by cruel anticipation and excitement. The one on the left, lanky with thick ribbons of muscle along his arms and shoulders, pulled a pistol from his waistband. I could hear the click and see the flicker of metal as the moonlight caught its surface. Not only could I see the confidence brimming in his eyes, I could feel it. He was expecting me to hesitate, to cower as he pointed a gun between my eyes. Trusting my instincts was something I had done countless times as a human. It was what kept me from being harassed by Frank or manipulated by Melissa. Following it now was easier than ever. Even with the gun pointed at my head, I charged. I watched as the vein in his neck bulged, and his emotions shifted from confident to unsure. It was then that I ducked, just as an explosion of heat and gunpowder rang out. Despite it being so close to me, the sound had as much impact as an insufferable fly would. Before I could get my hands on the man that had nearly shot my head off, I felt the grimy touch of the second. His rough fingertips met the skin of my shoulder for mere seconds, and the revulsion that blasted through me seemed to have more of an impact than I thought. For whatever reason, my arms flew out at my sides. An instinctual movement that felt righter than anything else. The warmth and unbridled energy I had been stealing from the men, it rushed through me. It crackled and snapped, like lightning beneath my skin. I knew in that moment, I had a choice. I could let the energy out, let it escape into the world under my command. Or, I could snuff it out. There was no hesitation on my end, the weakness burned away by the truth of what Marcus was doing. The two men who had managed to withstand the vile emotions I sent their way were blasted back in opposite directions, swallowed by the darkness of the forest. I could hear branches snapping, some larger and louder than others as they both were shoved back through the forest. 
Only when they both landed, and the sounds of insects and animals returned, did I blink and back away from the damage. I felt Alec behind me before I turned to meet his eyes. He didn't bother pulling me into his arms, knowing that I currently felt like a live wire. My skin was tingling, electrified by the energy I had consumed. I rubbed at my arms, trying to chase away the odd sensation. Let me guess, you're going to ask me what I was thinking running in there like that. I mumbled, taking in the carnage that was their campsite. Beer cans littered the ground along with burnt chunks of wood. Embers still burned in various places, scattered from the blast that sent both men careening backwards. Backpacks with clothes and other various items were all over the ground, along with the unconscious bodies of Marcus's men. Actually, I was going to ask if you're all right. He smirked, and despite how shaken and amped up I felt, he managed to take some of the weight from my shoulders. Halfway through my feral takedown of these men, I decided that I would no longer fear what I could do. I would use it responsibly and never to shove my power down the throats of others. Not only that, but I would no longer hesitate to use it if it meant freeing the White Wolves and taking down Marcus. Honestly, I feel incredible. I admitted, letting out a whoosh of breath. It was horrible to admit considering I had almost KLD six men, but it was the truth. Their energy filled my cells with strength, pouring adrenaline and life into my veins. I guess I guess I just surprised myself. I stumbled into Alec as Cade and Dex emerged from the forest, followed by Carson and Tori. Tori propped Carson against a tree and brushed herself off. Carson glanced around at the damage, forced to sit on the sidelines since she was still healing. I didn't miss the look of respect in her eyes, nor what happened when Alec and I touched. The small gasp that left his lips, too quiet and insignificant for anyone other than myself to hear, was followed by the crackle of energy as it danced from my skin to his. One of the men you sent flying into the forest is dead, impaled on a broken tree limb. Dex huffed, and I swore there was just a hint of smugness to his voice. I couldn't blame the emotion considering there were so many others who had lost much more to Marcus. The rest are FKD up, but they'll live. Didn't pick up any other sense nearby. This must have been the first batch of men sent out. Kate said to the five of us. Should be safe to head out now. You could have saved us a lot of time just doing that from the beginning, kid. Dex shook his head not at all angry with how things had turned out. He ran a hand over his head and glanced around at the fallen men. When his eyes met mine, they weren't wary or afraid, but hopeful. There's not an army that wouldn't fall should you go up against them. Let's hope I can manage it on a larger scale. I cleared my throat, shifting uncomfortably under the attention. I didn't exactly have control over myself just now. You just need to figure out how to trigger it which it seems you just did. Dex responded gruffly, now you gotta see how far you can extend it without hurting yourself. Something tells me with an ability like that, you wouldn't want to overuse it. Let's get out of here, I have to work harder to cover our sense now that we've been here so long. I trailed between the twins, beside Tori, who looked a bit worse for wear. Her clothes and hair were covered in dried mud, and I knew she'd need help brushing out those tangles. Even in the midst of my rage, I hadn't forgotten what the men said about Zane. I don't think I'd ever forget a word they had said. He finally decided to stand up to Marcus. I told Tori, keeping my voice low. The others could hear easily, but it at least gave us the illusion of privacy. I'm guessing something you said finally worked its way through his thick skull. He finally listens to me, and takes it as the go-ahead to run back to Marcus. Tori snorted, my comment breaking up some of the tension in her emotions. It's not like it changes anything, anyway. Even if he manages to survive all of this, 
he'll never accept me. I can't understand why, though. I sighed, unable to help myself as Tori's emotions flitted over me one by one. It seemed taking the energy from so many people amplified my other abilities. I couldn't ignore her emotions, or the toll they had on my own. I found myself frustrated for her, at my wits over a man who isn't even my mate. I've never been able to get a read on his emotions, or Marcus's. Do you think it's another white wolf blocking your powers? She asked curiously, but it was something I had already thought of before. I don't think so. I shook my head, I think it's because neither one actually feel much of anything. They have such a tight grip on their emotions, especially Marcus. Just recently, Zane's hold on his emotions cracked. You were the one who caused it, actually. Tori hesitated, wide-eyed as she stared ahead. I wondered if my gift truly gave me the upper hand, or if Tori truly was oblivious to how affected Zane was by her. It was me. She scoffed, pressing her lips tightly together. She was silent for a few moments, but I could feel her curiosity building just beneath her surprise. If I loosened his hold, does that mean you were able to get a read on him? I lifted an eyebrow at her, grinning as her lips widened into a genuine smile. I hadn't erased the worry or stress, but these moments of normalcy were all that kept us from losing ourselves to the violence and savagery of our world. You clearly annoyed him off more than anybody else. It doesn't take magic to see that. I chuckled, but continued. I wasn't able to get anything specific but I can feel the bond between you two, and I know that it affects him. The more it pulls him towards you, the bigger he is. We walked unbothered for another three hours. On the second hour, buttery light began to pour through the trees. It brought warmth and the scent of sunlight and dew. At a seemingly random point in our hike, Dex stopped and lifted his nose to smell the air. The muscles on his chest contracted, and he nodded, satisfied with whatever he smelled. This is where we leave you for. He said with a firm nod, eyes strong and brighter than they had been. Wait what? I stammered, I thought you two were supposed to escort us to the drop-off point. This is the drop-off point, kid. Dex chuckled, gesturing to the trees that surrounded us. Where you're going? you'll find you got some enemies in common. Security is tight there, so there's some rules you got to follow before being let in. What do we have to do? I asked, more than ready to press forwards. If I had to run head first into this to bring change, then so be it. Keep heading this way another half mile. You'll exit the forest onto a paved road. This is the important part. Get on the road and stay there, don't move. Believe me, it won't take them long to come collect you. Dex nodded at the four of us, choosing to approach me. He held a large hand out, nearly three times the size of my own. I felt like a child gripping his hand, but did so anyway when he gave me a smile that held that flicker of hope. You might have some mixed feelings about your abilities, considering you grew up a human and all, but there are thousands of us who have been waiting for you. Dex shook the twins' hands next, and even Tori's. The most we managed from Carson was a sharp goodbye. She flashed me the smallest of smiles before leaving, which was as odd as could be on a face as stern as hers. It made her look younger, less burdened by whatever she carried with her. As the two of them left, Heading back the way we came to divert any oncoming trouble, I could feel her gratefulness in her emotions. It was a thank you in her own kind of way. We arrived at a slim paved road shortly after leaving Dex and Carson. Even the twins felt at odds with being so exposed, standing in the center of a deserted road. We listened with ears peeled for the sounds of cars coming. What we hadn't expected, were to hear dozens of trees shaking their leaves rattling and branches groaning. 
One by one, men and women dropped from the treetops. On all sides they continued to fall, until we were surrounded. Wait I told the twins, just as I felt them ready to attack. Dozens of emotions rushed through me, each one tethered to the werewolves that stood around us. They were peaceful, happy, hopeful even. There was nothing dark within their emotions, nothing that would lead me to believe they meant us harm. I looked at each one, reading the light in their eyes. They won't hurt us. The crowd of werewolves parted to let a woman through, her skin a dark shade of ebony. Chocolate braids hung down her back, the color matched the intensity in her eyes. I could feel the confidence radiating from her, and knew that this woman was a force to be reckoned with. I am glad to see you've all made it in one piece. That is a relief. She greeted the four of us like long-lost friends, her smile dazzling. I trust that Dex and Carson made it as well. They did. They actually circled back around to divert anyone else that might have been following. I assured her, not that we don't appreciate refuge in your pack, but who are you? My name is Athena, and this is not my pack. She smirked softly, turning back to look further down the road. In the distance, I could hear the hum of vehicles approaching. Actually, that should be them now. They insisted on meeting you here themselves. A single SUV approached, and pulled over on the small shoulder of the road. Some part of me had hoped to see Jaspa, or even his daughter. Any sign that their lives hadn't been taken. Nonetheless, I was equally surprised to see the golden hair of Alpha Isaiah and Luna Mara as they stepped out from the vehicle. Chapter 110 Tell me, what did you pick up from Athena? Mara asked, breaking the silence that I knew wouldn't last long. There were too many questions on our end, and both Isaiah and Mara could feel our rising curiosity. We were in the dark-colored SUV now, humming down the road we had once stood on as we neared Isaiah and Mara's pack. The faint scent of cherries and tobacco wafted from the front of the vehicle, where two dark-clothed guards sat. It was a bit of an awkward fit, with Tori sitting next to Mara and Isaiah, but I refused to let her take another vehicle. I was no stranger to how it feels when you lose both a mate and a best friend. It was something I wasn't willing to risk again, even if we were headed to safety. Tori didn't seem to mind and actually liked Mara as much as I. My mind strayed to what Mara had asked of me. It was difficult, giving a loose interpretation of a person based on just a few seconds of information. At times, someone's emotions were a direct reflection of who they were as a person. Other times, it wasn't so simple. What no one seemed to realize is that emotions aren't just one-dimensional things. They're multifaceted, and mix with one another to form something new. Anger and hatred turn into this festering mix, a noxious gas that poisons the soul over time. Joy and fondness, no matter if it's platonic or romantic, form long-lasting connections that allows love to bloom in its wake. It was this joy and fondness that I felt coming from Mara as she asked about Athena, though it was platonic in this case. She's very confident, but not in a headstrong kind of way. It's more like she's seen the worst of this world, but she refuses to let it harden her. I answered truthfully. I had picked nothing else up, and didn't want to give her false information, so I quickly changed topics. You care about her a lot, I can feel it. She's family in your heart. Yes, she is. Mara smiled fondly, the sight lighting up Isaiah's eyes. She became part of my family when she agreed to be my beta. Your beta? I asked, unable to contain my surprise. My eyes flickered to Alec and Cade, who sat on either side of me. I was squished between them, their hulking forms taking up nearly 90% of the space in the back. I narrowed my eyes and frowned. You two never told me I could have a beta. 
Truthfully, I never even thought of it. Alec admitted, giving Mara a polite smile. It's not something traditional packs do. Cade nodded, and I watched the obsidian in his eyes soften as he looked at me. His voice was gruff but there was no mistaking the kindness that hid within them. If you want a beta, you can have a beta. No, it isn't something traditional packs do. Mara scowled, but I could feel the pride behind her words. I could feel Isaiah's amusement towards his mate's anger and wondered if she had ranted about this topic to him more than once. Traditions keep us whole as a people, but the ones that inhibit the she-wolves of this world from moving forward, they ought to be abolished. Starting with keeping us from positions of power. We had been driving for nearly an hour, passing caps of pine and cedar trees. The thick scent of sap mixed with crisp mountain air. Even with the two guards up front, I tried to pretend that we weren't fugitives seeking shelter as we found our way back home. So, you both know Jasper as well, then. I broke the silence, unable to stop the questions I had from bubbling on my L, P.S. Everyone knows Jasper, he was a large part of the high table. Even if he feigned uselessness with his inactivity. That was perhaps the only thing that kept Marcus from truly suspecting him. Mara laughed, and while the sound was beautiful, it was both bitter and joyous. Yes, Claire. Jasper has helped us a time or two, and we have returned the favor. An odd thought came to mind and I found myself speaking freely, did those favors include helping some white wolves find refuge? I had my answer when surprise washed through both her and Isaiah, though their faces were schooled into identical masks of indifference. I understood the perfected looks of cluelessness, especially when Marcus held most of the power in this world. One visit from him, and you'd want to fortify your walls, protect your people. We all have our secrets, especially those of us against Marcus and the remaining table members. Isaiah said, sounding wise despite how young he looked. He locked eyes with Mara, and the two of them seemed to fade into their own world. I knew the look, the glassiness in their eyes. They were speaking through thoughts, having a conversation disconnected from the rest of us. The vehicle was cloaked in silence for the next two minutes, until they finished their conversation. Isaiah looked back towards me, worry creeping at the corners of his emotions. You must forgive us, but we hold high stakes in all of this. Especially now that a war is brewing. She will understand, Isaiah. Mara said softly, her eyes never leaving my own. Isaiah was the caution to Mara's fearlessness. He was the voice of reason that held her back. I could only imagine how he handled both Mara and Athena. The thought only made me like the two of them more. I'm positive her abilities make her a good judge of character. You'd be correct. I can tell that you're both being honest, and that you're very protective of whatever it is you're hiding. I nodded, glancing between the two of them. It was an invasion of privacy, but one I couldn't turn off. I could try to ignore the emotions I felt around me, but they washed down my shoulders regardless. A smirk formed on Mara's face as I continued, matched by my widening smile. Actually, it was your general hatred for Marcus that piqued my interest in you both. I might have never noticed you if I couldn't feel what you were feeling. It gave me hope that there were at least another pack who saw him for what he was. I told you this girl will change things. Mara grinned wildly at Isaiah, who gave me an apologetic smile. I am not an optimist. He admitted reluctantly, sighing when Mara began to laugh. Not like Mara is. I'm not an optimist either. I'm a realist, darling. Mara chided her mate with an intimate smile. She looked towards me, and kept her gaze locked on my own. Sooner or later, Marcus was going to be in. After everything he has done, 
that much negative energy won't just knock him down a peg. It'll obliterate the ladder entirely. This was the first time I had been up in the mountains. Each steep incline and decline had my blood pumping, but it was the rocky slope of the cliff a few feet away that had me breaking out in a cold sweat. Over the course of an hour, every single car on the highway had exited. Just as I thought the forest and highway would never end, we took an exit towards Vale. The exit led onto a small two-laned road, which led through the forest and deeper within. Both Tori and I audibly gasped when we finally made it into town. Mara and Isaiah radiated pride and I could clearly see why. The streets were cobblestone, rounded and smoothed without any wear or tear. Robust streetlights dotted the strip of road we were driving on. The speed limit slowed drastically, giving me plenty of time to absorb everything. A few men and women walked down the wide sidewalks, towards the smaller shops that sat along the road. Behind those shops I could see mountainous walls climbing upwards, capped with snow. They towered over us, caging us in. Oddly enough, instead of feeling trapped, I felt protected. The only grocery store in town was a relatively small building, but its huge windows let in copious amounts of warm sunlight, and the clerk had been one of the nicest women I had yet to meet. There were two gas stations, a quaint coffee shop with a large chalkboard sign, and even a small hair salon. We continued through town where the shops and street lamps thinned out. Forest once again surrounded us, but I could now make out the houses within each cluster of trees. Some of the houses were larger than others, and sat towards the forest's edge. Others were smaller, but had winding driveways that led deeper into the forest. Finally, it was our turn to venture down one of these driveways. The guard driving maneuvered the SUV over the rocky path, towards a little two-story house just a hundred feet into the forest. The outside of the house had initially been a light shade of baby blue, but whoever lived here clearly had a fondness for painting. Slashes and platters were painted across the house, porch, and even some of the windows. There were vines of twisting flowers, curls of starving flame, and waves of cobalt and sea green. Most of the slashes and paint marks made no sense, but somehow seemed to cohesively go with the house. The front door, which had once been white, was now various shades of red and gold. Off to the side of the house was a huge garden, the star of the show being at least a dozen fully ripened tomato plants. We exited the vehicle as it rolled to a stop just in front of the wraparound porch. Mara led us up the stairs, but stopped at the front door. This place is incredible. I told her, glancing around at the thick trees that shot far into the sky. We have been working on this for the last ten years. Mara smiled proudly. You've been working on the house for ten years. I questioned, trying and failing not to give her a strange look. No, the town. She chuckled, shaking her head. I thought the town was the capital of your pack. I replied, looking between both Mara and Isaiah. No. For all intents and purposes, this place does not exist. While you four are here, you do not exist either. Mara said with a proud smile, and though the way she said it was a bit ominous, it was exactly what we needed. I am trusting you with this, not only because I hope it can win us this war, but because I would very much like to be friends in the future, Claire. And the same goes for you, Tori. Mara smiled softly, though I detected just a shred of nerves. Whatever she was protecting, it was very important. I did not tell you the entire truth when we first met. Marcus did take my sister when she was thirteen, but it was Jasper Fox who helped get her back, ten years later. It was a favor he owed me, one of my choosing. Rescuing Sabine it nearly had him caught. He rescued your sister from Marcus, ten years later. I couldn't keep from my words, 
not with the way Mara's heart ached and her throat burned from guilt and shame. She is not the same as she once was. Mara said softly, clutching the doorknob in her hand, pushing it open. A part of her has never come back from that place. The soft sound of singing trickled through the house, sounding towards the back. We found the source as we ventured into the living room, and stepped on the thick plastic sheets that lined the floors. Standing across the room, with her golden hair pulled up in a bun, was Sabine. Much thinner than Mara, Sabine had a wispier form. She was singing to herself, her eyes closed as she slashed and swiped with the paintbrush. She made broad strokes down the wall of the living room, mixing pinks with blues and greens with yellows, as she painted in a language only, she understood. Sabine, I told you I was bringing guests. Mara said softly, though Sabine still jumped at the sound. Pain passed through Mara as she recognized her sister's reaction. I absolutely love what you've done with the walls. The blues and pinks are just stunning, like a sunset. She hid the emotion well, but I could feel the stab of sheer terror that wrapped itself around Sabine's neck the moment she had been startled. For that split second, she hadn't been rescued. She was still right where Marcus wanted her. Sabine turned to the four of us, her face slim and cerulean eyes unnaturally bright. They weren't quite looking at any of us more like, past us. One Luna has twins, and the other Luna has the cursed son. She said in a dreamy voice, her pale L, P.S. opening and closing. I could feel Tori tense, and just when I thought Sabine might continue, she blinked with surprise. Oh, would anyone care for some tea? It has butterfly pea flowers. They turn purple when you add lemon juice. How wonderful! Chapter 111 Both Tori and I obliged, clearly wanting to hear more of what she might say. Things come to her at random, but do not press her too hard. Simple, straightforward questions. She becomes overwhelmed easily, and it takes hours to calm her down. Mara frowned gazing ahead to where Sabine tiptoed into the kitchen, her movements smooth and silent. Just as well, do not say Novak Senior's name. It triggers something in her, a vision or perhaps a memory. All I know, is it is horrible enough to cause her to harm herself. So, speaking his name around her is forbidden. You're all right with us asking her some questions. I asked just a tad surprised, even with the boundaries she had set in place. I could feel how much Mara loved her sister, how devoted she was to seeing to her every whim. Sabine had been through so much in those ten years, most of which I'm sure she couldn't talk about, and Mara was determined to make up for every second of it. It was why she let Sabine paint the walls, pouring her emotions into the oils and acrylics, focusing her fear into the coarse bristles of the paintbrush. I trust that you will not cause her unnecessary trauma. Mara said with a strong voice, though not unkind. Her seafoam eyes flickered to where Sabine stood in the kitchen, standing over a pot of tea as her eyes once again went glossy. Within seconds, the vision had ended and Sabine resumed her humming. I cannot begin to imagine what she's seen but any information she gives could provide us the upper hand. I never had a reason to drink tea before, but with the way Sabine made it, I'd have to look into some myself. Incredibly sweet and floral, with a fruity undertone. There was none of that bitterness and old leaf taste I had experienced at the restaurant as a server. Even the lemon juice, which in fact had turned the tea purple, was steeped in sweetness. We sat out back, where a screened-in patio jutted out from the house. Padded chairs with hand-painted cushions sat around a large glass top table, which had thin fines and wispy pink flowers decorated along the top. There were still a few dried-up cups of paint sitting towards the outer edge. Outside of the patio and down three small steps were a grill, 
covered in multicolored hand prints. It's nice to meet you, Sabine. All of your artwork is incredible. I told her in a kind voice once she took a seat at the table. Alec helped carry in a tray full of small teacups, a bowl of sugar cubes, and other little glass bottles in from the kitchen, flashing me a wink before sitting down. I knew very little about tea, but this seemed much more complicated than the simple sugar and water mixture we made at the restaurant. We've already met, Claire. Don't you remember? She asked, her voice twinkling and soft. Up close I could see that her eyes weren't the same shade of seafoam as her sister, but a pale shade of sky blue. They were filled with dreams and nightmares, all of which were very much real. Her thin L, P.S. dropped as she read the confusion in my eyes as easily as I could feel her emotions, flitting by like cars down a highway. Oh, has that not happened yet? Or is it happening now? I apologize, I get so confused at times. Don't apologize, my abilities can complicate things too sometimes. I shook my head, letting a genuine smile form on my face. I could feel her relax, and marveled at how strange her emotions felt. They seemed to come from nowhere, rushing through her as fast as those fragmented visions seemed to hit. This is the first time any of us are meeting you. Ah, this is the first time, then. She beamed, the wavy strands of her golden hair falling from the clip that held it in place. She looked so proud of herself, so joyful that I couldn't dare smother it. She plopped a few sugar cubes into her tea, and added a splash of cream before continuing. What she said next did nothing to dampen her mood and everything to dampen my own. Good, that's very good. That means you still have one, two three days left. Mara stilled, her eyes flitting between Sabine and I judging from the shock in her emotions, she had yet to hear Sabine utter a word about this upcoming deadline. Sabine, what is happening in three days? Mara asked softly, reaching out to squeeze her sister's hand. The assassin and her hound will come. Then chaos will follow. She murmured, pulling her hand away from Mara's with downcast eyes. As quickly as they fogged over, it had vanished. She perked right up as her eyes cleared and smiled at all of us, any more tea. We need connections to someone who was in Zane's father's pack. I scowled, catching myself before his name slipped from my lips. There has to be a way to find out who this assassin is, and her hound. Sabine was out back, painting the pavement patio that made up a quarter of the backyard. I could hear her humming trickling in through the back door, but still wouldn't risk saying his name. Is there anyone else in town from his pack that might know who Sabine is speaking of? Kate asked, the depth to his voice made him come off as a bit aggressive. He cleared his throat and smirked down at me, hearing the big bad monster I made him out to be in my thoughts. Anyone we wouldn't harm by asking. Mara and Isaiah looked at one another, their eyes glazing over as their stream of thoughts meshed as one. After a minute or so, awareness fluttered back into their eyes. There might be a few we could ask, but there's always a chance they won't respond well. Isaiah frowned. They agreed to join our pack when they stayed, we gave them the choice. Mara nodded softly at her mate, placing a hand on his own. He let out a soft sigh, the short strands of his golden hair falling across his forehead. We can ask this of them. Even though I hadn't noticed before, this quaint little town was full of warriors, most of which were stationed in the surrounding mountains and forest. It was hard to scent them at first, as the wines were harsh and the forest dense. Scents thinned out easily, carried off by distant wines. Those who weren't protecting the town or watching for any intruders were protecting the very house where Sabine stayed, where we all stayed for the time being. Isaiah slipped away to place a few phone calls to the houses in town that held previous members from Marcus's pack. 
Random couples and fractured families were placed in large cabins and homes together. From what Mara explained to Tori and I, things were comfortable here. There had even been a few mates discovered in the process. Isaiah came back nearly an hour later, his golden eyebrows knitted tightly together. With the way his cell phone was gripped in his hand, I wondered if he had found anyone we could speak to. When his emotions registered within me, I found myself surprised. Small fractures of worry cracked at Isaiah's foundation, spreading until it split off into larger splinters. They buried themselves in my mind, my chest, and lungs. You found out who they are. I sucked in a sharp breath, feeling my own heart rate increase with his. Darling, what did you find out? Mara frowned, glancing between the two of us. She placed the palms of her hands on his face, down the light stubble that coated his tanned skin. It's just rumors, stories told in his pack to frighten them all into submission. Isaiah replied, his voice notably stronger. With a small smile that spoke of gentle affection, he removed Mara's hands from her face and placed them against his lips. Once they were no longer touching, that shadow fell back over his eyes and the worry continued to creep in. There were three who were able to give me some insight, though the details change from person to person. The assassin is a white wolf, one with the ability to resist abilities. Another said she has the ability to steal abilities, but I find that improbable. The hound is just as bad, unfortunately. They're a tracker, one that doesn't miss. Once the hound has your scent, there's nowhere on earth you can hide. One went as far to say that the hound could sniff your body from out the bottom of the ocean. How wonderfully comforting! I said, my mouth dry and eyes wide. That can't be real, right? Tori scoffed, crossing her arms over her chest. Her eyes were concerned, but also held that rigid edge of fearlessness she was known for. A white wolf who can resist the powers of other white wolves. What kind of power is that? She's just a normal wolf, then. Assuming she's earned her name, I believe the semantics of her abilities comes in second place. Isaiah countered, making Tori's grimace deepen. Besides, that's not the most interesting part. When Sabine said that chaos will follow, she meant, chaos. As in, a person. The assassin, the hound, and chaos. They're who he sends when he needs someone halfway across the world dad. Chapter 112 The plan since arriving in Mara and Isaiah's pack had been to get the four of us back home safely in time for the inevitable war, which could easily happen at any second. Now that not one, but three deadly werewolves were coming for me, we had a time limit to our plans. Three days, we would have to leave in two. That meant not only coming up with an evacuation plan, but Mara and Isaiah had to make plans of their own. Danger and DTH had followed us, putting all of these white wolves at risk. An entire city dedicated to their safety, to remaining invisible. Ten years of blood, sweat and secrets and it had all been jeopardized in the span of an hour. They'll find you no matter where you go. Mara shook her head seeing the war brewing in my eyes. For a moment, I wondered if she could feel emotions too, or if she was truly just that in tune with everything going on around her. These people live here knowing it is their safest option, though not infallible. They understand that its discovery could happen at any moment. If we leave in two days, is there a chance that your warriors can divert the trail so that they go around the town? Alec asked a million ideas running through his dark eyes. We could leave tomorrow, just as the sun sets. It is possible, but the most important part is ensuring you four make it back to your pack. Mara squared her shoulders and turned her eyes to me. Every single person in this town knows who you are, and they would all willingly sacrifice their lives if it meant getting you out. 
I understand that you do not want your life put before anyone else's, but you are the head of this movement. Packs that have remained quiet for decades are finally speaking up. They're finally stepping forward and it's because of you. If you do, so does the courage that many of these packs are experiencing for the first time. You are hope to them, someone too strong to be controlled. How far things had come, from a mundane human to a hunted fugitive. Mara's words followed me, echoing in my ear as her, Tori, and I left the house. Sabine's humming sounded oddly as I descended the porch steps with a weight in my chest. We had no time to relax or reoperate. Isaiah and the twins were staying behind with Sabine, to figure out a plan on getting us out of here safely. Contacting anyone outside of town wasn't possible, not without risking exposure. Mara and Isaiah could mind link the rest of their pack members, no matter how many miles away. With Mara at the wheel, we drove into town and pulled into the parking lot of a modest-looking building. Made from red brick and rectangular windows, a handmade sign read Public Library. We won't have all the answers, but there might be something that can help you. Mara explained as we entered, listening to the little golden bell attached to the door ring. We were enveloped in the comforting smell of rose incense and warm tea. She made no move to head to the front desk, where a woman in her fifties smiled warmly. Mara made a beeline for a door that read, Employees Only. Marcus also likes knowledge, which means restricting it from everyone else. This is the only safe place we have for our pack's collective knowledge. Everything we know, passed down from countless generations. We headed down a set of metal stairs, into a dark and damp basement. Another door led us to an old meeting room. There were shelves lined against the walls, full of books both dusty and old. Two wooden tables held multiple books on top, some pried open with tools smoothing down the pages. We try to preserve the older ones, and repair them when we can. She explained, gesturing to a wall full of small boxes, most of these boxes are official documents, but there's also news articles going back at least a hundred years. Are all of these recounting from your pax ancestors? Tori marveled, eyeing a bookcase full of journals. Most of the covers were peeling and the pages stained yellow, but I could only imagine the wellspring of information inside. Many of them are, that was how we recorded our history. Mara nodded. You'll find some scientific journals as well, but I'm not entirely sure if any are on the subject of white wolves. You both may take as long as you need. I am going to coordinate with some of the other pack members on how they might aid us with your evacuation. It would take weeks to go through all of this. Tori shook her head, trailing her fingers over the dusty journal spines. Her eyebrows were furrowed and I knew that part of her mind was somewhere else entirely. Unfortunately, we only have a few hours, but at least I have the best assistant a girl could ask for. I teased, smiling when some of the worry faded from her eyes. Assistant. She scoffed, precariously pulling a few journals from their shelves before setting them down on the nearest table. Her flaming hair bounced as she plopped down, gingerly lifting the cover with her fingernail. Now that I know Luna's can have a beta, I think I'd like to request a raise. It was my turn to be surprised, completely caught off guard. I mean, I had thought the same thing, but I knew how rocky things were between her and Zane. If there was ever that chance that they could be together, I could never hold her back from that. For a moment, I wondered if Tori had temporarily taken my abilities, because she read the look in my eye for exactly what it was. I know, I think the same thing sometimes. She hummed softly, glancing down at the journal in front of her. What ifs and all of that? It just hurts more to think that way, to plan some kind of future with him when he clearly doesn't want me there. I can't put my life on pause for him 
and if that means never becoming a Luna well, there's a lot of good I can do as my best friend's beta. Don't you think? I think that was well said. I mused, unable to help the smile that overtook my face. I grabbed a few journals as well, crinkling my nose when the scent of dust and cracked leather fluttered into the air. Besides, he doesn't dictate whether or not you're a Luna. You might have the official title as a Beta, but you'll always be more than that. So does that mean I got the job? She smirked, wiggling her eyebrows in a much more Tori-like fashion. Well, I'm not sure yet. I shrugged, tapping my chin. There's a lot I'm going to need from you. References, a test. Past employers I'm pretty sure none of those things matter now that we're fugitives. She smirked, emerald-colored eyes warm and light for a change. We laughed and joked for the next few minutes, stealing back some normalcy from the man who had threw both of our lives through the blender. Through the bleary-eyed chuckles, we could almost forget where we were, even with the scent of old books lodged in our heads. We got to work right after wiping trading laughter for quickly exchanged comments on what we were reading. The clock in here had long expired, and ticked away even though the hands never once moved. I knew time was creeping by as my eyes began to dry and the small spot between my eyebrows arched. There were so many white wolves back then, with so many different powers. Tori said softly, both amazed and horrified. There still are white wolves just as many. I said what we both knew, they're just not free. I swapped between musty journals and brittle feeling newspaper clippings about pack politics and even a few murders. Things were a lot different when white wolves roamed freely, lived freely within their packs. As there always is in life, there were white wolves who craved destruction and violence. They did as many humans do, they stole took what they wanted from whomever. The difference was that these werewolves had magic, an advantage that made them more dangerous than a common MR. There was always a price, a price for freedom. This was that price, that the white wolves let out into the world wouldn't all be peaceful. I knew that this was the first thing I would do once stepping into power. I would make sure that we survived, that our kind truly began to flourish and that those who wanted to hurt the innocent were removed from the equation. I trusted that my absolute lack of experience would be mitigated by the knowledge of my mates and family. I trailed my eyes over what felt like the hundredth journal. The tiny black script made my eyes ache, and felt like agony as I arced and curved over their PS and QS. It was a single phrase that caught my eye, one I had almost missed. I saw her with my own eyes. Lady Anne healed the blacksmith's boy. The village crone had fixed his broken and brittle body after a fall from a great tree. A scream of fright was not foreign, especially one from a child. The plague and dysentery s asterisk d our villages, devoured our young and rotted them before our eyes. We felt the loss less than the mortals, though still as deep when our devout were among those diseased. Initially, I had planned to turn around and walk in the opposite direction as the ill child. Having children of my own and two lost to the Creator, I could risk no more than anyone else. Lady Anne held no home, no devout bonded to her soul. Long had the village been waiting for her DTH, waiting for disease to claim her. Lady Anne was among the seldom few who had not felt its cold touch. Not one knew her health was a curse from the Creator. I knew it as I turned, as I watched Lady Anne approach the boy's broken body. Cartilage and flesh, bone and sinew. A canvas highlighted by the boy's melancholy song, which now was nothing more than a whimper. The way her eyes grew bright when she touched the boy, the way my own life flickered and ebbed. Lady Anne was cursed with devouring life, my own life. It was that very life she was then giving to the blacksmith's boy. My breath fueled his heart, the blood in my veins knitting the wounds on his skin. I blacked out shortly after, 
hearing nothing but the rush of blood in my ears. I had not seen Lady Anne since that day, but have long watched the boy grow into manhood, free of illness and plague. I'm not sure how this helps us, but I think I've found something about my abilities. I frowned, glancing up at Tori. Her hair was a tangled mess from how many times she ran her fingers through it, meshing the curls together. It's kind of discouraging. Tori had just enough time to skim the delicate handwriting before the door was wrenched open and Mara came through. The sharp edge to her worry had me standing from my seat grabbing Tori's hand to follow her without a single word. Something's wrong with Sabine. She said through clenched teeth as we sped through the center of town. There weren't many cars out, as the sun had already begun to set. It was easy enough for her to weave in between traffic as we coasted forwards. She has episodes, which is understandable considering everything she's been through. Sometimes they are worse than others when visions flood her too fast for her to process. We swung into the driveway, kicking up dirt and gravel as we clambered from the SUV. A quick patter of feet on the porch and we were all inside. Admittedly, Sabine's episode wasn't what I had expected. It was quiet in the house, eerily so. It was when we came upstairs that we understood what was going on. Alec and Cade both leaned against the wall outside of what looked to be Sabine's bedroom. Both pulled me into their embrace, but quickly let me go as I noticed what was going on. A door of pure white painted in splashes of pink and swipes of neon green. The door was open, showing Sabine and Isaiah inside. Isaiah stood off to the side, pleading with his eyes while gently speaking to Sabine. What happened to her? Mara asked fiercely, following Isaiah from the hall. She has never acted like this, even when you slipped up and said his name. Sabine made no move to show that she had heard Mara. She stood in her room, coated in dark-colored paint as she furiously splashed and swiped away at the walls. Colorful art was covered in splotches of black and blue, walls of pure crimson. Her movements were twitchy her eyes wide and glossed over as she swiped and slashed. Is she having visions? I asked Mara, stepping into the bedroom to get a closer look. Her eyes were clouded, pools of blue that seemed just a tad too hazy. There was some awareness there, but not much. As for her emotions, they were a whirlpool. Fear, disbelief outrage. A festering mess of negative emotions that rushed by her all at once. I stumbled back, feeling my head pound and my vision blur as all of those emotions passed through me. Delicate sparks trickled up my wrists and arms as I felt the touch of both Alec and Cade. You all right, doll? His words were tinged with worry, whispered down to my ear. It's her emotions. I shuddered stepping back into both of their warm embraces. Alec with his spicy scent, and Cade with his rich one. Both masculine and delectable, but noticeably different. I understand why she has these episodes. It's like she feels everything from her visions, but it's all at once. Anyone would get overwhelmed if they were constantly being swarmed all of the time. I stood back with Alec and Cade as Mara entered the room, walking up slowly to Sabine. Her sister made no notice, still scratching and slashing at the paint on the walls, covering bright pinks and purples with darkness and blood. It looks like a war zone. Cade shrugged, making an offhand comment that seemed just a tad too true. The slashes of crimson overtopped the black, it did look like a war zone. Both Tori and I jumped when Sabine's scream filled the room and hall. Mara had placed a hand on her shoulder, tearing Sabine from her vision as she stumbled backwards with her hands raised. Do not touch me. She hissed, colliding into the corner of the room where she remained rooted in place. I wasn't sure what compelled me to move forwards. Perhaps it was the mind-splitting fear Sabine felt and how her psyche seemed to be in two places at once. 
or it could have been my own inner compassion, I wasn't sure. All I knew was that one moment I was standing with Alec and Cade, and the next I was just two feet away from a very terrified Sabine. I glanced between the two sisters reading the very different fear in both of their eyes. I felt both equally, and for that brief moment, I was both older and younger sister. Terrified for my life, and the life I had thought lost. Mara's eyes hardened when she met mine, and finally, she gave me a firm nod. I seemed to have some inkling of what that meant, because I took that as my okay to move forward. I could never understand what you went through, but your sister these people here, you can protect them. You can keep him from them Sabine, but you have to tell us what you saw. The words came from my mouth smoothly, despite the obvious tremor in my hands. I placed my hands on Sabine, and felt my knees buckle as her fear washed over me. Years of it, stacked on top of one another until details and memories became warped and fuzzy. She was neither here nor there, but everywhere at once. Trapped beneath Marcus's thumb, a child thrown into a cell, an adult finally freed, a sister after so long of being alone. Surrounded by real people, flesh and blood instead of that of her visions. The text about Lady Anne briefly ran through my head, and I wonder if it was that or past theories that forced my next actions. Much like feeding from someone's soul, this held that similar connection. Only this time instead of pulling and tearing with vicious claws and sharpened teeth, I was giving. Claws and teeth retracted, nothing but flesh and smooth skin. Energy passed through me in a flood of warmth, resonating in my chest as it thrummed down my arms and into Sabine. She was no longer screaming, her eyes frozen but not clouded. Slowly, she blinked a few times. Her eyes darted around the room, at the painted walls and canopied bed, at her sister who she looked at for the longest. Finally, her eyes traveled back around to me. They found out you knew they were coming. Plans have changed, the three will be here in one hour, and he'll be here in five. Her voice wasn't weak nor were her words whispered. They were spoken with clarity, and not that dreamy tone she had been using when we first met. What did you do to me? I couldn't tell the difference between what I was seeing, what was real. I can separate them now, the visions end, and memories. You're her, you have to be. The girl with eyes of earth and water. A spasm of panic settled in my chest at what I might have done to her, that it may wear off, but when I saw the blossoming joy and fear on Mara's face, I couldn't bring myself to fracture that. I think I am. I replied, my voice just a tad pained. I stumbled backwards as I let go, wondering how much energy I had given Sabine. There was something nagging at the back of my mind, something I had to ask her. How did he know that we found out? I thought he didn't know you were here. Sabine was silent for so long that I wondered if she might not answer the question, or if she'd sink back into her trauma and the memories and visions that once flooded her. My daughter knows. She finally whispered, a shaky hand coming up to cover her mouth. She works for him. Alec caught me as I stumbled back his hands gripping my hips as he all but kept me standing. Cade frowned and closed in as well, but it was Mara who first spoke up. I have heard the whispers, but I prayed they weren't true. Her voice mirrored her sister's, horrified at the thought of Marcus having her niece, and fearful of the woman she has become under his influence. We will do what we can to help her, but for now we must take action. What are we supposed to do? If they're an hour away, that means they know this place exists. I frowned, leaning into both of the twins as I mustered up the strength for the upcoming hour. Trying to evacuate the town in time will not work. Sabine spoke before Mara had the chance, earning another look of stunned surprise. Her voice still held that distinct swell of kindness, a trait I was relieved she kept despite she went through. 
They have others following close behind, enough to cause much DTH. Then what are our options? Mara hissed, though not at anyone in particular. She glanced at Isaiah, whose eyes were just as pained. We will fight, and use that diversion to get Claire, her mates, and friend out safely. Isaiah said with finality, giving his mate a long look that made pain sear beneath my skin. You and Sabine will go as well. Nonsense. Mara spat, eyes hardening. If you are staying to fight, I am as well. We go together, Isaiah. Do not forget your promise to me. Sabine will go with them. I will not have her anywhere near that man, never again. I am sorry, Mara. Sabine whispered, eyes shimmering like sapphire watercolor. Whatever I had done to her, it cleared the fog from her mind and brought her back to the present. I hadn't healed her of those invisible wounds. Of the bruises and slashes that trauma leaves, that remain open, manifesting themselves in your dreams and thoughts. I hadn't healed that part of her, and I wasn't sure if I could. I don't want to leave you again, but I cannot go back there. Do not apologize to me. Mara shook her head softly, taking Sabine's hands in her own. Instead of cringing away, Sabine returned the smile. Stay alive, and free. You have spent long enough in a cage. The very thing that keeps this town safe from outsiders is the same thing that risks its exposure. Located in the middle of the forest, nestled in the mountains, there are at least six different ways for Marcus's people to infiltrate the town. Within half an hour, the entire town understood what would soon happen. That they would play diversion while I escaped with my mates, best friend, and Sabine in tow. Rather than send warriors out to defend those six entrances, everyone pushed further to the center of town. There they would fight against any of the white wolves Marcus had sent with the three. I trust you will do everything possible to keep her safe. Mara whispered into my ear, wrapping her arms around me in an embrace that smelled of sunflowers and shea. I do hope we meet again, Claire. Preferably in this life. After a teary goodbye between Mara and Sabine, she and Isaiah left ten minutes later. They planned to converge with the rest of the town, at the center where they waited for Marcus's white wolves. With Mara wearing my clothes and Isaiah wearing the twins, they carried our scent throughout the town with them. There would be backup coming in around an hour or two from now, from the nearby cities within Isaiah's territory. Marcus now knew that without a doubt, Mara and Isaiah were involved in the resistance. From this point forwards, war would be declared on their pack as well. Should I fail and Marcus win, there would no longer be a place for them in the world. Right on the hour mark, warning bells sounded throughout the entire town, echoing down deserted streets and back roads. Long and monotonous, they were the exact opposite sound of what my heart was making. Two conflicting beats that both carried the same amount of foreboding. We waited ten minutes before slipping out the back door, keeping behind houses but out of the forest as we progressed further from town. If I listened hard, I swore I could hear the sound of snarling as white wolves fought one another to the DTH. Each of us had showered before leaving, changing into clothes that didn't carry our scent. It was a bit more difficult for Sabine, who had lived in the house long enough for her scent to reach just about everything. I knew something was wrong when we were half an hour away from town. Sabine had stopped in her tracks, her eyes going foggy for just a few short seconds. She blinked a few times and looked around, fear creeping and growing with every second. What? I asked, taking her hand even though she hardly knew me. I couldn't help but feel she might have known me fairly well considering she's been seeing visions of me since she was a child. What is it? What did you see? I shouldn't have come with you. Her voice was feather-soft, broken and fractured. 
That flicker of hope had burned out before it had the chance to become anything more than a small ember. A crack sounded in the forest, making Cade whip around. They've found us because of me. The first thing I smelled was body odor, masculine and thick with sweat. It was overbearing, and I understood why when a towering figure emerged from the forest. He was easily six foot tall, though in the muscle department. Shaggy bark-colored hair hung down to his shoulders, greasy and poorly brushed. Patchy stubble coated his chin, and sweat-stained clothes hung from his body. He was one of the least intimidating men I had ever met, but the hound wasn't meant to look threatening. He caught my scent. Sabine croaked, her entire frame trembling. I turned my head to Tori just as another figure emerged from the forest. Get her out of here when they ATK. I told her, my voice low and just barely audible. When I saw her eyes widen, and turn defensive, I harz hanaid my tone even further. I knew she could see it in my eyes, that I wasn't asking. It was her first test as my beta, the first test to see if she could suppress those Luna instincts and listen to a direct order. I mean it, Tori. Focus on her, not me. Both Tori and I moved in front of Sabine, making sure she stayed behind the towering forms of the twins. I could feel her trembling and taste her fear from the few feet away we stood. The next to emerge, coming to a stop just a few feet closer to us than the hound, was a petite-looking girl. She was young, with rounded features that could easily pass for eighteen. Even though there was a certain kind of youth to her, I did not miss the thick muscles along her arms and legs. The last to step out was Chaos who would have easily been one of the most beautiful men I had ever seen, if it weren't for the sinister light to his eyes. It had nothing to do with the fact that they were a rich shade of crimson, which stood out brightly from his onyx hair. It was the glint of satisfaction in them when he noticed I wasn't alone, that there would be others to take out before grabbing me. A washed-out band t-shirt and some torn jeans completed the look though there was nothing salvageable within this man. A sociopath through and through. Just as Sabine had said, the assassin and hound had finally come, and chaos followed. Chapter 113 Just as Sabine had said, the assassin and hound had finally come, and chaos followed. Are you going to come with us willingly, Claire? The assassin spoke first her voice a delicate falsetto. Your little magic won't work on me, but I'd love to see you try. Something at the very pit of my stomach told me not to use my abilities on her. I didn't have those punch-you-in-the-gut feelings very often, but this was one I couldn't ignore. The way she sang my name sent a shiver down my spine, which I suppressed with gritted teeth. She plucked a knife from one of the straps around her leg and held it in her hand. Her glossy auburn hair was tightly pulled back, wrapped in a braid at the base of her neck. She only reminded me of the blade I had as well, given to me by Isaiah before he had left with Mara. It was a kind gesture considering I barely had a clue on how to use the thing. Either way, if the assassin got her hands on me, this blade could quickly become my salvation. Clearly, she was the star of the show, the one who led the other two. Chaos was foaming at the mouth, flashing his movie star smile that seemed all wrong with the cruelty in his eyes. The hound just stood there, mindlessly staring at the five of us, nostrils flaring as he took in our scents. I'm not going anywhere with you. I assured her, forcing as much false bravado into my voice as possible. The assassin shrugged indifferently and nodded at Chaos, whose smile widened into a grin. A tremor of excitement seemed to snake its way down his back, making his fingers twitch and eyes sparkle. Yeah, been waiting forever for this. He hooped, inky hair falling back as he threw his arms out towards the five of us. I realized too late what Chaos's ability was, and that he hadn't been aiming for the five of us but for the twins. 
The twins' obsidian eyes brightened, turning a rich shade of crimson that mirrored chaos's. Enveloped me when I realized that while I could still feel the mate bond, I no longer had access to their stream of thought. Awareness was leached from their sight, leaving room for nothing but chaos. Alec and Cade turned towards one another, snarling and tensing up. I acted without thinking the moment I saw Cade's hand shifting into that of a wolf, nails elongating into curved claws. I lunged forwards, though not towards the twins, and not physically. I lashed out with my abilities, desperately trying to sink my hooks into chaos and pull with everything I had. Just as I felt myself make contact, and form that connection, the assassin sliced through them with cold hot steel. She leaped forward with incredible swiftness, with the hound tailing her. Her muscular form still moved incredibly fast, making me scramble into action. Chaos was engrossed with the twins, using them like a child would battle with two action figures. Cade lunged at Alec, slashing his elongated nails across the soft flesh of his face. I snarled in sync with Alec, who was already shifting before my eyes. I needed to do something, and fast. Another minute and I'd be lucky if I had one mate standing. I wanted to glance at Tori and Sabine, who were both just as exposed as I, but I couldn't risk placing attention on them. Instead, I did what any completely sane werewolf would do and ran. I veered left into the forest, knowing I wouldn't make it very long or far. The goal wasn't to escape, but to get them away from the twins, Tori and Sabine. It was the exact opposite of what everyone had been telling me that I was more important than everyone else, that I had to stay alive and away from Marcus at all costs. My chest was racked with pain, because at the end of the day, I couldn't sit by and let the people I cared for me. So here I was, running into the arms of the enemy. Even as I heard the assassin snicker at my back, I couldn't bring myself to regret doing everything humanly possible to save my mates. If there was one thing I promised myself, it was that now I needed to be strong. Claire, weak human daughter of Melissa, was skin shed from my shoulders. There was room for nothing else no one else, except for Luna Claire. I was knocked to the ground, shoved into the dirt just half a minute in. The taste of it filled my mouth followed by a disgusting grainy texture that crunched beneath my teeth. The gentle scent of gardenias and rose petals filled my nose, and I met the not-so-gentle eyes of the assassin. They were a deep, chocolate shade of brown that held rich undertones of caramel. Even though I lacked the fighting skills of your typical Luna, I still had the reflexes. I wrapped a hand around the leather-bound hilt of the silver blade currently hidden within my belt loop. I had no doubt the assassin had earned her name by writ of blood, but she had made the same mistake everyone makes when they become the best at their trade, she became complacent, she underestimated me. I'm positive she was told everything about me, that my abilities were the most dangerous aspect of my personality. I had no formal training, no lifetime at being raised a werewolf, but I now had a network of people dedicated to train me to keep me alive. I wasn't sure where I had found the sudden bout of brutality, or whether it had always lived within me, but I tore the blade from my belt and jammed it into the first thing I could think of, her chocolate-colored eye. The heart would have been the obvious choice, the easiest when it came to securing a KL. Alec taught me that going for the obvious KL wasn't what you should do against a more skilled opponent. Surprise them use your inexperience against them. She hadn't been expecting me, much less something like her eye. Such a vital part, especially in her profession. Metallic warmth splashed against my face, mixing with the dirt granules in my mouth, and the assassin's furious howls grated my ears. Instead of panicking and turning her attention to her gaping wound, she tore the knife from her eye and frantically ripped her gloves off. I could still hear the sizzle from her flesh as the silver knife burned her skin, destroying any chances at healing her wound. 
Her hands touched my skin before I had the chance to get away, and it was then I fully understood what her abilities were. She didn't just block magic, she fed on it, stole it from other white wolves. Her touch made my blood run cold, my sweat freeze and breath come out in strained huffs. My veins were clogged with ice, churning and scraping against my flesh as my heart continued pumping. Her nails were digging into my skin, pinpricks of cold in a torrent of ice and snow. You! She hissed incoherently, so furious with me that I wondered if she'd just end my life here and now. I could feel her spittle or perhaps blood, misting across my face. This is silver this is silver. I'll never heal from this. I'm going to kill assassin, you good. Chaos's husky voice sounded from a few feet away, jolly even as it made my hair stand. The assassin let go of me, and I gasped as the pressure had finally been lifted from my body. She snarled at Chaos, whose eyes widened in genuine surprise. Why and did you let her get the upper hand on you? Boss isn't gonna like this, assassin. You better not let this swallow up your rate. I didn't let her get the upper hand, and it won't swallow up st. She hissed, sending me a look so full of venom that I thought I might actually faint. I can still kill you just the same. I let out a grunt as a bony shoulder slammed into my gut, followed by the rancid scent of body odor as it flooded my nose. I opened my eyes to see an upside-down version of the world, watching my hair as it trailed across the ground. I was slung over the hound's shoulder like meat, hauled deeper into the forest. The world sloshed back and forth slowly, leaving doubles and triples of everything. With the blood rushing to my head, I could hardly keep up with what I was seeing, so I decided to focus on what I heard instead. What did you do with her little mates? The assassin asked, sending me another DTH and destruction-filled look that overlapped one another three times. I could still feel the cold rattling in my chest from where she had touched me with her hands. Left them wounded real nice. Chaos sighed unhappily, garnering my attention. Didn't have time to maul them the way I've been practicing, not with you screaming in the middle of a invasion, making hound drag my ass through the woods. Relief flooded through me, washing some of that miserable cold. They were alive which meant Tori and Sabine had to be alive as well. She took my eye, chaos. The assassin hissed, and for a moment I thought she might either MR chaos, or come finish her work on me. I'd like to see how well your little tricks work with one eye. You know, I don't see why our soul eater here needs two eyes to work some magic. Chaos commented in between whistling some annoyingly repetitive tune. He came up behind the hound and bent over, tilting his head so that he could look me in the eye. His movie star grin turned lopsided, giving him that perfect boy next door vibe if the boy next door was a raging psychopath with crimson eyes. I call dibs on the brown one. I think I'll dry it like one of those little heads. An eye for an eye. The assassin mused, and I hated this look of gentle contemplation even more. My eyes fluttered once, and then twice before we had finally emerged from the forest. I knew I had to have blacked out at some point because the sun was hanging precariously low in the sky, casting splashes of orange and yellow across the horizon. Shove her in the back. The assassin's voice grew louder in my ears, followed by the sound of a car door opening. Her form was hazy at first, but cleared up the more I blinked. She was glancing down at her watch, tapping on the small screen. We've got fifteen minutes before the Alpha and his show up with the entire brigade. I told boss those wolves weren't ready for real battle. Chaos sighed dramatically, though I knew he wasn't upset over the lives lost. Another poorly thought out plan flitted through my head. Fifteen minutes if I could stall them for that long, then Mara and Isaiah would show up. That had to be who they were talking about. I groaned softly when I was tossed onto a cold leather seat, 
but quickly turned over and pushed myself into a sitting position. I had limited time, and scoured the floor of the van for anything. There were splotches of paint, and what I hoped wasn't blood, along with plenty of dirt and little bits of trash. My fingers ached when I felt a slightly bent nail beneath them. It was one of those large construction nails. Judging from the way my fingers stung, there had to be some percentage of silver within the material. It was stuck under a small piece of plastic, protruding from the floor. Within seconds, the hound slid into the front seat and the assassin into the passenger. I wrapped my hand around the nail tightly, trying not to look completely frazzled. My heartbeat could be heard throughout the van, but the fast-paced pattering wasn't anything out of the ordinary. My stomach clenched as the back door opened, just a few feet away from where I sat. Every muscle in my body tensed, coiled, and ready. Even my wolf, whose words of encouragement were all that kept me going, waited with held breath. Chaos opened the door to the van, and when he was halfway through, I launched myself at him. Join our Facebook and WhatsApp group for more updates, link is given in description, rest audio book will be continued in next episode.